Today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you a mentor and colleague at UCSD, Dr. Larry Goldstein. Larry is currently a distinguished professor in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at UCSD and the Department of Neurosciences. He received his BA in biology initially at UCSD and his PhD in genetics from the University of Washington in Seattle. He then did his postdoctoral studies at the University of Colorado in Boulder and then went to MIT before moving on to Harvard as a young assistant professor, where he later became a full tenured professor. Happily for those of us at UCSD, Larry then decided to return to his alma mater here as professor of pharmacology and became an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Throughout his career, Larry has not only made major contributions to science, but has also played critical roles in science advocacy, including, and importantly for us today, playing a key role in the establishment of CIRM in 2004. In keeping with his belief in the importance of stem cell research, in 2006, Larry established the UCSD Stem Cell Program, serving as its director until 2016. In 2012, he established the Sanford Consortium for Regenerative Medicine and continues to serve as director. From 2013 to 18, he served as director of the Sanford Stem Cell Clinical Center. So if you're getting the idea that Larry is key to stem cell research at UCSD, that's the right idea. In recognition of his scientific impact and contributions, Larry has been honored with numerous awards. In the interest of giving Larry time to give his seminar, I won't highlight all of them, but, but mention some of them here. He's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2016, he was appointed as an American Society for Cell Biology Lifetime Achievement Fellow. In 2019, in recognition of his longstanding commitment to policy and public service, the International Society for Stem Cell Research established the Lawrence Goldstein Science Policy Fellowship Program to train more young stem cell scientists to be active in public policy discussions. Earlier this year, as Kat mentioned, Larry was elected to the prestigious National Academy of Sciences. It's one of the highest honors that we can bestow on US scientists and engineers. So throughout the years, Larry's research has given us important insights into molecular mechanisms involved in trafficking inside neurons, very long cells, beginning with studies in fruit flies and moving on to studies in mouse and now human models. Today, he is going to tell us how some of these studies have led to exciting new insights and potential treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Larry. Good morning. What I want to tell you about today is work that we've done with support from the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, or CIRM, in which we've used human stem cells to probe mechanisms of neuronal changes in Alzheimer's disease. And I'll also tell you about a drug that we're getting close to putting into human clinical trials that we hope will help with the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. I've also been asked to give you a little bit of history as I tell you about our scientific work. And so I wanna go back to the beginning of my scientific career, which was actually here at UC San Diego, where I was an undergraduate student. And it was that here at UCSD where I discovered that while I had originally thought that I wanted to go to medical school to become a physician, in fact, I discovered a love for scientific research that led me to graduate school and to basic science research with the goal someday uh, in the long term of trying to develop approaches to human disease. And as you'll see, that journey I think has been fruitful. So I began my scientific career here at UC San Diego and my odyssey uh, then took me to Seattle, Boulder, Colorado, and then to Boston where I assumed my first faculty position at Harvard. And while at Harvard, we used fruit fly genetics to tackle the problem shown in the next slide. And that is that neurons have substantial traffic and transport problems that they have to solve. And that's diagrammed here, where I've given you a somewhat simplified diagram of a neuron. And one major part of the neuron is called the cell body, 
that's the factory of the cell where proteins and lipids and other molecules are synthesized. And then you'll see there's this long uh, projection called an axon, which is simultaneously a tube through which materials are moved out to the synapse, which is where neurons connect to other cells. But the axon is also a wire through which electrical signals are propagated down to the presynaptic ending, again, to talk to adjacent cells. And what's remarkable is that neurons can have their cell bodies, for example, located in the spinal cord, in the peripheral nervous system, and then the axon can run a meter or more down to the muscles in the toes. So it's a very long journey, both for the electrical signals, but it's also a long journey for the materials that need to be transported. Now, the peripheral nervous system, which is what I just told you about, is a very extreme example of neuronal uh, size and asymmetry. But in the brain, there are comparable problems of distance for the movement of materials. And it was this movement of materials that we first became interested in, in some of our work using fruit fly genetics to try to understand the mechanisms by which these movement pathways actually worked. Now, in the course of this work, my lab and many others working on this problem in the field became convinced that this kind of long distance traffic problem was the sort of biological process that could be defective in a variety of neurodegenerative and other brain diseases. And as I'm about to tell you, we think that part of what goes wrong in Alzheimer's disease is a failure of these neuronal movement pathways. So let me just give you a bit of background on Alzheimer's disease. What you may remember is that Alzheimer's disease is very common. 10% of people over 65 is the estimate. And so I'm a candidate to develop this disorder in the near future, unfortunately. It's a progressive disease. Once it starts, there's no reversing it, uh, at the moment at least, and that's because it's effectively incurable. The only drugs we have that affect Alzheimer's disease at all really don't do very much. They have rather minimal effects, and they really don't change the course of the disease substantially. Now, one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease is the loss of so-called synapses, which are the connections between neurons that are needed for signals to be sent from one neuron to another. And in Alzheimer's disease, what you may know is that ultimately the disease results in massive neuronal death. Now, what I'm showing you here are the so-called amyloid plaques which are these plaques of material found in the brains of people who've died from Alzheimer's disease. And these plaques are at the center of what's called the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which is the dominant hypothesis in the field. Although, as I'll tell you, I actually disagree with some of the basic tenets of this idea. And in the amyloid cascade hypothesis, the plaques or constituents of the plaques are thought to induce the formation of the other major pathology in Alzheimer's disease, the so-called neurofibrillary tangles shown here, also found in the brains of people post-mortem. And the thought, as I just mentioned, is that the plaques or something about the plaques lead to the tangles, and these tangles are toxic to neurons and probably uh, cause neuronal cell death. Now, the plaques themselves are composed of a short fragment of protein. This fragment is called A-beta, uh, and it's shown down here diagrammatically where A-beta is a small piece of a larger protein molecule called APP for amyloid precursor protein. APP is going to figure prominently in the next few minutes in this lecture, and the thought is that a beta is released from APP by fragmentation of the protein, and this freed A beta then forms amyloid plaques, and then the plaques or the A beta itself directly in the uh, amyloid cascade hypothesis, at least, are thought to lead to the formation of tangles 
and subsequent neuronal misbehavior. Now, I've re-diagrammed this hypothesis here uh, because, as you'll see in a moment, I think it's probably more complicated than this. And the basic idea is that rare genetic mutations that cause hereditary Alzheimer's disease lead to elevated levels of A-beta, as do so-called genetic risk factors and environmental risk factors such as TBI, traumatic brain injury. Uh, and this A-beta, as I mentioned in this hypothesis, is thought to lead to uh, neurofibrillary tangles, or NFT, formed from a protein called tau, another neuronal protein. And when tau gets a phosphate group put on it, so-called p-tau now, that leads to the formation of NFT when there's enough p-tau around, which in turn leads to synapse loss and then Alzheimer's disease. Now, one of the features of neuronal misbehavior in Alzheimer's disease is there's reason to think that these mutations and other risk factors lead directly to neuronal misbehavior, perhaps in collaboration with A-beta, perhaps on its own. Movement inside neurons seems to be one of the pathways that misbehaves in Alzheimer's disease and that then also contributes to the formation of P-tau and neurofibrillary tangles leading to neuronal uh, failure and death. Now, when we first started studying movement pathways in neurons in Drosophila, we did experiments such as those shown in this short video, where you can see those bright white spots that are moving inside of what looks like a narrow tube. That narrow tube is a neuronal axon in a fruit fly. And those moving white spots are actually moving APP that we can track using video microscopy. And you can see that there's movement in both directions. There are variable velocities. And it's a very interesting biological process that one can analyze using fruit fly genetics. Interestingly, if one makes too much APP in a neuron, what happens is the formation of these large, bright blobs of material, which look for all the world like blockages of the axon. And with higher resolution microscopy, one can see that they do, in fact, sometimes block the axons completely, leading to the inability of APP and other cargos to reach the synapse. And What's interesting is that when we moved to San Diego, we began to work on mouse versions of Alzheimer's disease, often involving the production of too much APP in neurons. And we saw very similar behavior in the mouse as we saw in the fruit fly when we manipulated the levels of APP and other Alzheimer's related molecules in fruit fly or mouse axons. Now, you can immediately see the problem that we then confronted, which is that Alzheimer's disease is a strictly human disease. Fruit flies and mice don't really get Alzheimer's disease. Even when we uh, misproduce uh, or produce too much of some of these APP or related molecules. And of course, the, the answer to why this this is the case is, of course, obvious. Humans are not just big mice. In fact, you can fit an entire mouse inside of the human brain, and you can fit an entire mouse brain inside of a human eyeball. And so clearly, the scale of the problem is completely different. And in fact, the human brain is quite a bit more complicated. And I'll just mention in passing that to even get features of Alzheimer's disease in the mouse, you have to add the human genes. Mouse genes on their own won't develop Alzheimer's-like behavior. So something special about humans is at play in disease. And so with the help of CIRM support some years ago, we began to use human stem cells. Uh, in particular, we used human embryonic stem cells at the beginning to begin to learn to make human neurons in a dish 
and to start inducing Alzheimer's-like behavior in human neurons grown in uh, tissue culture dishes in the laboratory. Now, while we began with human embryonic stem cells, we, uh, after a few years, switched to the use of so-called human-induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells, or IPSC, as uh, abbreviated in this diagram. And what's done uh, in outline is shown here, where one takes a skin biopsy, that is a chunk of skin, from either a control patient or an Alzheimer's disease patient. One then grows a cell type called fibroblasts out of those uh, chunks of skin. And then using genetic trickery, it's possible to induce those fibroblasts to form induced pluripotent stem cells, which have the ability to make neuronal progenitor cells, shown here diagrammatically in a dish. And by further treatment, it's possible to get those neuronal progenitor cells to do what we call differentiation, that is transform into different cell types, including, if we do it properly, neurons. And those neurons, as shown diagrammatically here, if the original biopsy was taken from an Alzheimer's disease patient who had a hereditary form of Alzheimer's disease, the neurons made from those fibroblasts and iPS cells have the genetic changes that cause Alzheimer's disease. Or if it's a control patient, the neurons have a control uh, genome and properties. And we can then use these control or Alzheimer's disease neurons to measure some of the proteins typical of Alzheimer's disease, either A beta or phosphorylated tau in the examples I'll show you in the next couple of slides. Just to re-summarize the amyloid cascade hypothesis, plaques are made of A beta, tangles are made of P tau or phosphorylated tau, and the amyloid cascade hypothesis says the plaques or something in the plaques like A beta leads to the tangles. When Mason Israel was a graduate student in my lab, he used the IPS technology to make control neurons and Alzheimer's disease neurons, that is neurons carrying genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's disease. If we measure A beta that these neurons produce, NDC stands for non-demented control. These white bars here are the level of A beta found made in control neurons. And if you just look over here to the right, where it says FAD, that's neurons carrying a genetic mutation causing Alzheimer's disease. We refer to that as FAD for familial Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that those Alzheimer's disease neurons produce quite a bit more A beta than controls. And if we measure levels of P tau, for example, controls are relatively low. The hereditary or FAD neurons are relatively high, as would be expected. And this was the first of the Alzheimer's disease in a dish model from humans that we created and published a few years ago. And of course, one of the questions we wanted to ask is, is it the case that the A beta leads to the formation of P tau? in these neurons, and I'll just summarize a complicated series of experiments by telling you that the evidence that we've been able to generate is that the A beta is not the inducer of P tau, but it's a related larger fragment of the APP molecule that causes the formation of P tau. So at least in this simple version of Alzheimer's disease in a dish, the amyloid cascade hypothesis does not seem to be the major route of formation of P tau. Now, the other kind of experiment we can do with these familial Alzheimer's disease mutant neurons is we can look at the movement and transport and trafficking pathways. And one example of what we saw is shown here, where again, I'll remind you, the cell body is the part of the neuron that makes materials and the axon is the pipe through which materials are moved out to the connections to other cells. And what we observed in these familial Alzheimer's disease mutations is that if we looked at the APP molecule, it was clearly elevated in the neuronal cell bodies, 
Here's a control image, and you can see these bright white spots that are not present in the control, but are present in the Alzheimer's disease mutations. And then when we quantify it, you get the graph shown here, and it's quite clear that there's a lot more APP present in the cell body of these neurons. And these are the axons. These are two control. You can see these bright, long fibers, and you can see that in the mutations, the FAD mutants, the level of this white material is much, much lower. And you can see again in these uh, graphs that in mutant axons, it's much lower than in control axons. And that's why we uh, draw this arrow as uh, indicating a reduction of APP in the axon. And so it looks as though there's a defect in the movement of APP from the cell body into the axon. Not a complete block, but a substantial reduction in this hereditary Alzheimer's disease mutation. Now, for a variety of reasons, in particular based on our read of the literature, we began to suspect that lipid particles containing cholesterol might have a defect in their movement into the axon. So the experiment that Grace Woodruff and Saul Reyna did in my lab was to take lipid particles containing cholesterol and feed them to neuronal cell bodies. And what we observed is that there's a pronounced reduction in the amount of these cholesterol-containing lipid particles that were internalized into the cell body, and there was also a reduction in the amount of those lipid particles that were transported into the axon. So there's some defect in the handling of cholesterol-containing particles in these Alzheimer's disease mutation-bearing neurons. And so we began to wonder whether it might be possible to take advantage of these Alzheimer's disease mutations to see whether drugs that uh, altered cholesterol in the neurons might affect the behavior uh, of these neurons, perhaps improving it. And so we, in this case, Rick Vanderkant and Vanessa Langness, in collaboration with Ann Bang at the Sanford Burnham Prebus Institute, did a drug screen using, again shown diagrammatically, neurons that we made in these large 384 well dishes that carried neurons made from hereditary Alzheimer's disease patients by the route of fibroblast to iPS cells to neuronal progenitors. And then each well gets incubated with a different drug. And then we measure the levels, for example, of PTAL. And in this graph down here, we've plotted how each drug behaves with respect to its raising or lowering of PTAL. And each dot here is a drug. And so we became very interested in the drugs that were farthest from the average of most of these drugs, which had no effect. And what was very striking is that among the drugs that did have a substantial effect were cholesterol-lowering drugs. And there were two classes. One somewhat large class are the so-called statins, which are used by many people to control cholesterol levels in the blood. And another drug, called efavirins, which I'll explain uh, to you in a moment, which lowers cholesterol in the blood by a different mechanism. Now, the other thing I want to mention, because it's important to this line of discussion, is that when looking at the brain, it turns out that with respect to cholesterol, the brain is basically a sealed system, so that cholesterol in the bloodstream does not enter the brain, and so the brain has to synthesize its own cholesterol uh, in order for neurons to be able to use cholesterol to do its normal functions in the building of cell membranes and other uh, important neuronal activities. And one of the things that was interesting with the finding that statins in particular uh, affected the behavior of PTAU in these Alzheimer's disease mutant neurons is there's a long literature on whether or not statins affect Alzheimer's disease development and uh, progression 
in actual human patients. And I'll just summarize years and hundreds of papers by saying it's confusing. We can't really tell what's going on. Part of the problem is it's not always obvious that statins are getting into the brain properly, and even then when, whether they're behaving as we might expect them to. And one reason for this confusion might come from the next uh, slide and diagram, because we wanted to know whether these drugs were affecting cholesterol or whether they had more complicated behaviors. As you may know, statins do have side effects in many people, even though they're, they're in fact very good drugs for controlling bloodstream cholesterol, it's much less clear what's going on with brain cholesterol with statins. And so this uh, awful looking uh, set of pathways here uh, summarizes what's known about the synthesis of cholesterol. And cholesterol is synthesized through a multi-step biochemical pathway where each black box is modified to give rise to the next black box, which is a different compound, ultimately resulting in cholesterol at the bottom. And it turns out that statins, as shown here, block a very early step in cholesterol synthesis. And if you look at this, what you'll notice is that there are branches to this pathway in which intermediates in the pathway of cholesterol formation lead to the production of other molecules that are important in the brain and also in the periphery. And so one of the things we wanted to know is whether cholesterol was actually the important target of statins, and as you'll see in a moment, this drug efavirin is down here at the bottom. And so when we treated uh, Alzheimer's disease and regular neurons with statins and measured levels of PTAU, an example of what we saw is shown here. Statins indeed result in the reduction of PTAU relative to the control level shown here. But of course, we didn't know whether these branches are what was leading to the reduction in PTAU. And so what you see in all these red letters here are a bunch of different inhibitors we used of different biochemical steps working our way progressively down closer and closer to cholesterol and away from these branches in the pathways. And what we found is that inhibitors way down in these steps, which resulted in, the reduction, in a reduction in cholesterol without affecting the levels of these molecules produced in the branches, still led to reductions in PTAU, suggesting to us that cholesterol may be the actual target that's affecting PTAU. And in fact, when we treat with this drug shown here, efavirenz, efavirenz is an unusual drug because what it does is instead of blocking a step, it stimulates a step. And so when you treat neurons with efavirenz, cholesterol is broken down into a molecule called 24-hydroxycholesterol, which is then exported from the brain and degraded. And in fact, interestingly, efavirenz treatment also leads to reductions in PTAU, as shown here, uh, indicated with this black arrow here, relative to control. And so this suggested that cholesterol, or one of the molecules very near cholesterol, was the primary inducer of reductions in PTAU relative to control. Now I'll come back to efavirenz in a moment because it has a variety of features that make it look like a potentially good drug for Alzheimer's disease in our opinion. Now another ex series of experiments we did that I won't show you all the details of uh, is that Following statin treatment or efavirenz treatment, we measured the levels of a lot of these different lipid uh, molecules related to cholesterol. And those measurements suggested to us that the actual molecule controlling the levels of PTAU might actually be this molecule here called cholesterol ester. And this is actually a storage form of cholesterol in the brain and elsewhere. And so what we could do is we could inhibit the formation of cholesterol ester using these inhibitors in the black circle, which block this enzymatic step. 
And in fact, using these inhibitors, you can see that there's a reduction in the levels of PTAL relative to control, which led us to think that it may really be the cholesterol ester, the storage form of cholesterol in the brain, that's causing the changes in PTAU with statins and efavirenz. Now, an important issue if one wants to develop a drug such as efavirenz, which uh, we think has some uh, more desirable properties than statins because of the side effect issues, is you want to know whether all human patients are likely to behave the same way when exposed to efavirenz. And so we made IPS lines and neurons from a variety of different patients. And the data are summarized in this set of graphs. And what you can see in these white bars are different uh, patient IPS lines and neurons that we made. And they all respond to efavirenz and statins by reducing PTAU in more or less similar ways, suggesting that these drugs are likely to affect more than just uh, hereditary Alzheimer's disease patients. The other thing we wanted to know is, you'll recall in the uh, amyloid cascade model, A beta is the molecule that controls the levels of PTAU. And so we wanted to know whether the response of these neurons to statins or efavirenz was due to A beta. And the way we uh, asked that question was to use CRISPR mutagenesis to generate IPS lines that are what we call APP null. We completely removed the APP gene using CRISPR mutagenesis, and then we asked, are neurons that have no APP and therefore no A beta at all, do they have a similar statin, in this case, response to uh, formation of PTAU in response to different doses of drug. And what you'll see is that the black and the blue lines, which are the APP null mutants that lack APP and A beta, those lines are virtually superimposable on the control lines that we compared them to. And that tells us that A beta levels are not what are controlling uh, PTAU levels in these neurons. So taken together, what we think these data are telling us is that cholesterol, as part of its normal handling in neurons and in the brain, are stored in this cholesterol ester or CE form of cholesterol. And this is what statins and efavirenz are actually controlling uh, that lead to changes in PTAU. And in experiments uh, similar to what I just showed you, uh, we've argued then that A beta is not the primary modulator of PTAL levels, but that there's a direct pathway from cholesterol ester that responds to statins and efavirenz that is independent, a different pathway entirely from the A beta pathway, although PTAL and A beta might act in collaboration to induce synapse loss and Alzheimer's disease. And so this suggested to us that efavirenz might be an interesting drug to develop, primarily because its biochemistry looks to be quite a bit simpler than that of statins, which have all these branched pathways that I told you about a few minutes ago. Now, you can see the obvious problem with the work that I've just described to you, and that is that Human neurons in a dish, while they have the virtue of being human, not mouse or fruit fly, are nonetheless neurons in a dish and don't have the same structural and architectural complexity that an intact human brain has, nor a mouse brain for that matter. And so we wanted to test these drugs in some sort of animal version of Alzheimer's disease before we took uh, efavirenz in particular into human clinical trials just to be sure that the drug would get into the brain and affect, uh, as you'll see in a moment, neurofibrillary tangles made of PTAU, as we saw in a dish. And so what we did with Robert Rissman was to treat mice 
that ordinarily make large numbers of neurofibrillary tangles. In the cortex, these are these black dots that you can see in this low magnification image. And you can see that following simvastatin treatment or efavirenz treatment, there's a very substantial reduction in the level of these tangles in the cortex, and that's shown here where this is the control level, this is the level with statin treatment, this is the level with efavirenz treatment. And so from this, we can conclude that these drugs work very well to reduce P-tau in human neurons in a dish, in the mouse brain, in the actual mouse. And now the question that we want to be able to ask is, if we take efavirenz into human clinical trials, can we see that there are ultimately reductions in the misbehavior of these molecules in true Alzheimer's disease in human patients. So to summarize what I've told you, I've described evidence that genetic mutations and risk factors can lead to elevations in A-beta as well as other neuronal misbehavior, in particular traffic pathways. These have some relation to levels of cholesterol ester uh, the nature of those interactions we're not yet entirely sure of, but in aggregate, these pathways control the levels of P-tau and neurofibrillary tangles, and if these levels are high, you get synapse loss and the development of Alzheimer's disease. And so I just want to conclude by thanking uh, some of the people who did the bulk of this work in particular, the work on statins and efavirenz was done by Vanessa Langness and Rick Vanderkant. And in particular, I just want to point out and thank the biopsy participants, that is, all the human patients who gave us skin samples because they had Alzheimer's disease, either of the hereditary variety or the non-hereditary variety. And of course, a great many control Alzheimer's patients and this work simply could not have been done without CIRM support. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Goldstein. Um, thank you very much, Larry, for an excellent talk as usual. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, one for me to begin with, uh, considering that you have the 24-hydroxy cholesterol buildup, potentially, is there an opportunity to increase export of that out of the brain, as you mentioned, that, that that's part of the pathway to remove uh, cholesterol. Is there a way to drug that if efavirenz turns out not to be as effective as hoped? Uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, does direct manipulation of 24-hydroxy cholesterol help potentially in the treatment of disease? I think the answer is, or I know the answer is that we don't know. Uh, there's not a lot known about the handling of 24-hydroxy cholesterol uh, during export, presumably it's the same uh, problem of a variety of molecules crossing the blood-brain barrier. Of course, the interesting feature is that cholesterol itself doesn't seem to cross the blood-brain barrier. And I think it's a good idea to think about learning how 24-hydroxy cholesterol is handled by that cellular barrier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a very nice schematic in your paper in Cell Stem Cell in March 2019. Um, I was uh, asked a question here for you is, what about people with the APOE4 allele? Um, would they be more susceptible to efavirenz or similar cholesterol-mediated reduction strategies? Yeah, so the question is, how do we think about the APOE4 risk factor in this context? And just to remind people, APOE4 is basically the biggest genetic risk factor present in the human population. People with APOE4 uh, changes, uh, that is variants, are much more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease than people with what are called APOE3 or APOE2. Um, we haven't directly tested the effects of efavirenz or statins on APOE4 genotypes. We think that that's likely to be a much more complicated process because it's probably the case that so-called glial cells, astrocytes and microglia, are the primary producers of lipid particles containing APOE, either the 4, 3, or 2 variants. And so one needs a multicellular system, including neurons and glia, to look at that uh, problem, probably. Uh, 
and we, we just haven't done that yet. I think there are many other groups that are exploring how APOE variants affect disease development. There's some evidence that the APOE4 variant does change the internalization of lipid particles by neurons, but a great deal more work needs to be done. We're still scratching the surface of exactly how cholesterol handling occurs in the brain, both in terms of synthesis, transport, and then export. The next question is, um, there must have been Alzheimer's disease patients who had been on Simvastatin or other cholesterol lowering agents. Is there a plan to do a prospective study to study the use of statins versus a, a control group to see what the outcomes are like? There's quite a bit of literature in the scientific uh, literature about statin effects. And as I mentioned, they're a bit confusing. And part of the problem is we don't have good measurements of how e each different kind of statin does or does not get into the brain and at what dosage levels. And so my personal opinion, and this is guiding my uh, next set of research projects, is that statins are simply too complicated to deal with. And they have too many side effect issues and we don't have good measurements of how much of them get into the brain when you dose patients. It's why we think efavirenz is a better potential drug. It seems to enter the brain readily. It may even be concentrated in the brain and then it can act very directly on the pathways that we think are at risk in disease. So the plan is to move efavirenz forward. Uh, one question was, what about a combination strategy, knowing that the previous attempts had failed at um, targeting A beta? Is that worth it, or is it just that there's so little involved in Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis with the accumulation of plaque, of fibrillary tangles? So the question is, I think, you know, what do I think about targeting A beta versus other pathways in disease? And that is an enormously controversial question in the entire field. I'll just point out that all of the A-beta lowering treatments that have been put into clinical trials have failed to change the disease process thus far. And so while efforts to continue to influence that pathway are ongoing in a variety of companies and academic labs, I think it's not the most fruitful approach. And this is why uh, we think that targeting cholesterol may be a more potent uh, effector and pharmaceutical agent ultimately for Alzheimer's disease. And then the bioethical question is, um, taking a drug like epivirenz that's approved, or not approved for this indication, but um, has transited through the FDA and repurposing this, is there a way to accelerate the development of drugs for other indications like Alzheimer's disease where there's a pressing unmet medical need? How do you think we should get through that challenge? Is there a role for CERM there? It's, it's a great question. How do we accelerate the development of FDA approved therapeutics for off-label use? Mm -hmm. And I think CERM has taken exactly the right approach, which is to fund efforts at developing disease models for a variety of different diseases, and then to fund drug discovery efforts using FDA approved drugs because the so-called repurposing strategy does indeed uh, reduce the complexities of launching trials because one, one doesn't have to worry as much about toxicity, for example, because the toxicities are usually well known for the FDA approved drugs. Well, thank you so much, Larry, for sharing your groundbreaking work and uh, for being such an important leader in our field and maintaining our zeal for doing more great work um, led by you, of course.